Few anime do horror well, and of the few that do, fewer still excel. ReZero is quite remarkable in this regard, and not just because it's very good at using scary monsters, big and small, to mess its appealing character designs right up. Although, in its best moments of body horror, this series can be every bit as hard to watch as Maiden Abyss or those bits of FMA, the raw discomfort that raw animation provokes pales in comparison to the cold dread that creeps up on you as you contemplate and connect with its central character. When you cut away all the cutting and stabbing and smashing, smushing, crushing, twisting, chewing, nibbling, and general jibbing that happens to and around your boy Subaru, you know, the surface level scares, there remains an undercurrent of unease running deceptively fast, waiting to drag us with him down into a vast, dark abyss of despair. A kind of horror rooted not in the fantastically unpleasant things some fantastical unpleasant thing might do to your body with its teeth or knives or spooky ghost hands, but rather in the all too mundane agony our minds can all too easily inflict upon themselves. Yeah, baby, I'm talking psychological horror. ReZero is a series that seeks to dig deep into the bedrock of anxiety and insecurity that forms the foundation of, uh, a certain personality type with which you may be familiar never grew out of cartoons or video games, spends a lot of time fantasizing about being spirited away to some fantasy world where they can be a hero, get a girlfriend, and everyone will like them, doesn't go to school or work or outside as much as they should, or at all. It's a horror series for otaku in general and hikikomori in particular, and it knows its target audience scarily well. Better, to put it bluntly, than a lot of us know ourselves. It knows what we long for, it knows how we use flights of fancy to fill the void, and it knows how to twist those pleasant, escapist dreams into inescapable nightmares. It knows that, at our core, we are lonely creatures, and it knows and is all too eager to let us know that there is no world where we can escape that loneliness without changing that core first. ReZero explores that deep loneliness in terrifying depth, and Explanation Point already made an excellent video essay exploring that exploration. I highly recommend watching it, it's very funny and insightful, but I don't think it paints a complete picture of how the series handles the theme. It's a mistake to conflate the horror of loneliness solely with the, as X-Point put it, incel horror of being alone and unloved. And if that were all ReZero had going for it, I doubt it would resonate anywhere near as widely as it does. It is, in large part, what the first season of ReZero is about. After Subaru grapples with the very general loneliness of being a stranger stranded in a strange land with no one who knows or trusts him, and wins the undying love and loyalty of Rem through his diligent heroism, he does spend about half the series wrestling with the deeper, more personal horror of romantic rejection, of having some deep part of you seen by someone you love, and being turned away because they don't like what they see. When Subaru snaps at Amelia, he breaks something between them. Or maybe it would be more apt to say that he reveals what was already broken inside of him. Either way, he is left alone like never before, cut off from the only thing he had to live for in this world, and forced to carry on living regardless. As he is, there's nothing Subaru can do to bridge the gulf between himself and his beloved half-elf. The only way to fix what he's broken is to fix himself, to let the Subaru that Amelia rejected die and be reborn as someone who deserves the love he unfairly demanded. It's an excruciating ordeal for Subaru, one that very nearly breaks him, or at least pushes him to pretending that he's broken, makes him wish that he would break so that he could just give up, give in to his own self-centered sloth, and numb the pain. 
in reflecting the otaku personality's innate pride-born resistance to self-reflection and growth and highlighting how it leaves its victims isolated, the series manages to tap into a rich vein of psychological horror. But then, well, Subaru does it. At first, like many unpleasant otaku, he would rather die than change, but that's not exactly an option for him, so eventually he overcomes his own inadequacies, conquers his personal demons, plus one of Lagunica's demons and also a half-devil worshipping cultist just for good measure, and reaches Amelia fully ready to love and be loved by her. It is all, as they say, Gucci, at least until she says those fateful second season starting words. Subaru. Yes! Who is Rim? <sighs> and because ReZero is good horror, not studio-mandated mass-produced slop, it can't exactly walk back that Gucci-ness for a slapdash rehash of the same ol' same ol' in that sequel. Subaru has learned what it means to love and be loved, how it's about understanding the real person you care for, not just idolizing them. And while he does lose his most reliable love uh, supporter when Rem gets yeeted and eated by the Bishop of Gluttony, even the loneliness of losing a loved one isn't enough by itself to push him back to square zero. Emilia is happy he loves her, and may even reciprocate, even if Puck comes first in her heart. Krush, Felix, Otto, and many others treasure him as a friend. Beatrice believes in him, even if she won't admit it. Rom tolerates him, lovingly. And Roswall has... uses for him. Subaru can no longer truly be alone and unloved anymore at this point in the story. But that doesn't mean he can't be... isolated. In fact, you could say that the crushing alienation Subaru felt throughout Season 1 was just an appetizer for the smorgasbord of horrors served up in ReZero's second course. It's one thing to be lost among strangers, that only lasts as long as it takes you to make an acquaintance or two. It's scarier to be an outsider to an established social group, but that too can be remedied by befriending the insiders and carving out a place for yourself beside them. Even flat-out rejection can be overcome by working on yourself to earn acceptance. But what do you do when you are accepted, cared for by people you care for in turn, and you still feel alone? When there's some invisible, inexplicable, and seemingly insurmountable gap between you and the people around you that makes it feel like no matter how long you spend getting to know them, you may never really get them and they'll definitely never understand everything that's important to you. The only thing more painful than the loneliness you feel when you're alone is the loneliness you feel when you're not. And if it's scary to be alone when you're with friends or family, then it is out and out terrifying to feel that isolation when you're with someone you think you love, someone who seems to understand you and says they love you. Love is supposed to be the solution to solitude, right? If there's no escaping from it even in love, or worse, if the love you find to soothe it only hurts you more, then what the fuck are you even supposed to do? Everywhere he turns in this season, from Echidna's window's wallpaper to the arms of Amelia herself, Subaru is faced by some form or another of that question, and it threatens to gnaw at him until there's nothing left. Jesus Christ! I warned you! Ah, that's nothing. Those rabbits only chew you down to the bone. Subaru's encounters with the witches, where he flirts with their madness, begins to comprehend the unpleasant implications of their incomprehensible motivations, feels their love, and is made to understand the price of that love to himself and worse, to everyone he loves. Those things eat away at his very soul. They make him question who he even is, what he's even doing, when he seemed so certain at the season's outset. 
Subaru's been through shit, and in the process gained the strength to overcome the once insurmountable obstacle of escaping his Ikikomori lifestyle. He doesn't just one-shot a trial tough enough to break the sweet and strong-willed Amelia, he thanks Echidna for it when he's done. And watching him face his parents and accept their love, it's easy to see why. That's some good-ass therapy, easily one of the best-earned emotional payoffs in anime. But after setting that baseline for his current abilities, this season tests ReZero's hero like he's never been tested before. And not just in terms of the physical threats it throws at him, though to be fair, there are a lot of those to contend with this time around. For starters, there's the sanctuary itself, home to the undyingly curious spirit of a self-described very evil magic user. A building that magically traumatizes people by making them confront deeply uncomfortable truths about themselves as part of a convoluted combination lock, which is rough for him and rougher for the woman he loves, but someone's gotta take it on or else they'll all be trapped there with the angry half-beast people forever. On that note, immediately outside, there's a very angry man who's sometimes a giant tiger, and he can't seem to decide if he wants to kill Subaru or not. Also, he's very impulsive. Though he does have the exquisite taste to name Rom as best girl, so he can't be all bad. That said, he is in league with some dangerously adorable and adorably dangerous little elf clones whose intent is equally ambiguous. And on top of all these new potential threats, Subaru also has to navigate basically every other problem he's solved in every past arc of the series simultaneously. The deadly tension among the mansion staff has reached a boiling point yet again, and he's not sure if he can trust Roswell, Beatrice, or the new maid. If that wasn't enough, goddamn unfrozen Elsa's back, and with Reinhard nowhere in sight, he might just have to take care of her by himself. And hey, look, the mob beasts are attacking the domain again too, in a variety pack this time, led by Elsa Jr. Yay! So he's got to run back to the mansion to save people, again, but while he's busy doing that, again, Emilia's being threatened by yet more witch bullshit that could very well destroy her if he can't get back before she succumbs to her own unfathomable loneliness. Which, as you'll know if you've seen the Frozen Bond OVA, she's been grappling with for longer than Subaru's even been alive, with only Puck, who's now missing in action, standing between her and total crushing isolation for all that time. No small wonder, then, that without Subaru beside her, the psychological strain of the trial is enough to break her, giving the witch a chance to fill her vessel. And as if all that wasn't enough, somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the sanctuary, the only thing on the planet that's scarier than the white fucking whale is just hopping around looking for a snack. It's just a lot. And because of the nature of his power, because of what his immortal stalker will do to him and the people he loves if he tells them anything about the relationship she's forcing on him, assuming he didn't unwittingly make a contract with her at some point, Subaru has to bear all of it on his own. Well, okay, not completely, not anymore. Just as Rem managed to understand everything else about him despite all that he withheld in the first season, Subaru does find two people who get what he's going through in this one. But neither Roswell nor Echidna really cares about him. They just want to use and possibly abuse him if that's what's needed to keep him in line. Effective manipulation takes a soft touch, but Try to slip out of it, and you'll see how fast it can turn into a crushing iron grip. Leaning on any one of them to ease his loneliness will only isolate Subaru further. That's just what abusers do. Be they a controlling lover who idolizes him and refuses to let him fall short of that ideal, a dark reflection of his father who expects the boy to grow up to be just like him, or a very Freudian mother figure who sees everything he's going through and knows how hard he's working to get over it, 
but instead of stepping back and letting him figure it out for himself, wants to micromanage every aspect of his life to her own ends, shaping him into a man who suits her needs while claiming she's doing what's best for him. There's something particularly cruel, even for this show, about the reveal of Echidna's true intentions. Subaru was so relieved to be able to share everything the Witch of Envy had put him through with someone. That moment where he just keeps saying, I can return by death on loop, is one of the most cathartic scenes in the entire series. For the first time ever, it seems like he might really be able to escape his solitude. Really, though, he's just walking into a better hidden version of the same trap. The worst offense is when she uses Rem, that most precious and personal memory that he desperately wishes he could share with his other loved ones to control him. Not out of malice, mind you, she's trying to help with the trial, but help in a way that shows zero regard for or understanding of Subaru's feelings. They simply don't factor into her cold, logical worldview. To her, their relationship is purely transactional. It's totally fine that she wants to use him because she'll let him use her however he wants to. That he might not want that at all, well, she probably did consider it, being Echidna and all, but only as an annoying possibility. A contract with her would mean for Subaru, as it does for Beatrice, a life possibly an eternity of suffering, of struggling endlessly to find meaning in the whims of a mind that is fundamentally incomprehensible in its malignant sociopathy. And even if Echidna would love Subaru in her own twisted way, because love is understanding and he can't understand her, it would be impossible for him to ever love her back. Just as it's impossible to return the Witch of Envy's love, 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 love. He would be more alone than ever before. Thankfully, with the help of the other witches, he's able to find the good sense to reject her offer. But that still leaves him with nobody he can really talk to about what he's going through. And shouldering all of that weight alone has given him something else he can't talk about. This isn't quite as obvious in the anime, but during this arc of the light novel, Subaru is explicitly suicidal. It's one more thing that isolates him from his companions. I mean, how do you tell someone who cares about you that you want to die? Well, it'd be more accurate to say that he doesn't want to go on living in a world without Rem, at least at first. That specific feeling has pushed him beyond his own fear of death to reset more than once in the past, but now it just won't go away. It's a part of him. Not all of him. Part of him wants to be Rem's hero and carry on, but part of him is just tired. He loves Amelia. He knows he can bring everyone he cares about happiness if he just keeps going. Probably. He can't give up, but it's so fucking hard. It hurts so fucking much. He's lost everything so many times, and if quitting was an option, he'd definitely think about it. Losing a waifu will do that to you. Lying on the cold stone floor of an empty dungeon as time loses all meaning and a montage of your own excruciating deaths plays on repeat in your fraying mind will too. And so will having an adorable little bunny wabbit teach you a horrifying new meaning of A2M. I mean, yeah, somehow both of those scenes are even harder to read than they are to watch. But there's worse still in store for him. The second trial absolutely fuck Subaru shit up. Harder than watching Rem play Twister, harder than watching the Witch of Envy kill Emilia in front of him. Without Echidna's intervention, it could well have put him in the kind of broken, gibbering state of madness he pretended to fall into before Betelgeuse called his bluff. It very nearly breaks him in a way nothing else has. It fucked me up pretty hard too, if I'm being honest. 
Subaru is given a glimpse into each of the worlds he left behind when he returned by death and made to see the suffering of the people he left behind in them. Emilia, confused and heartbroken to find the result of his suicide right after he told her he loved her. Beatrice, grappling with the death of the first person in 400 years who really might have been that person. Julius, Ferris, and Amelia all mourning the reconciliations that will never, ever happen now after Petalgeuse possessed him. In one world or another, Subaru has inflicted on every single person he loves the exact same excruciating, lonely pain of loss that burdens him in the world that's forgotten Rem. For every slim victory, every act of heroism, every good deed he's fought for, he may have inadvertently inflicted ten times as much pain on the people he was trying to help. Well, maybe. It's entirely possible that there's only one timeline, and he really is just sacrificing himself over and over again to reset and save everyone in it. But it is also entirely possible that every time he's returned by death, be it by his own choice or someone else's, he's sacrificed an entire world line's worth of his friends to an unknown yet predictably horrible fate. In which case, is anything he's done even close to worth it? What is the point of continuing to crawl toward the slimmest possibility of a brighter future that may not even exist if that much inevitable suffering lies along the way? Can he really keep trusting in his mom's words that if he tries his hardest, all that will matter is how it ends? He has no choice but to keep going, but without that choice, he has no way of knowing if he really wants to. And the one person who does know, who can remind him as many times as he needs to hear it that it's not in his nature to give up, is stuck, forgotten by everyone else, in a magic coma. But at least in those feelings, he's not entirely alone. There is one other person who knows how it feels to wish they could just stop, yet have no way of doing so. One other person who knows how hard it is to bear the weight of a witch's expectations with no clear idea of what those expectations even are. One other person who knows what it's like to be stuck in one room, day in, day out, with no company save for the stories lining their shelves. One other person, besides Emilia, who knows loneliness the way Subaru does, I suppose. Beatrice may not be able to claim the same spot in his heart as Emilia, but within the fucked up family that Echidna has formed to oversee her tomb, she's the closest thing Subaru has to a little sister. And I am fully ready and willing to use that technicality to declare that Beatrice is, in fact, the best Emoto in all of anime. But as is the case with Amelia's father, Puck, the exact terms used to define their relationship aren't really that important. What really matters is that Beatrice is important to Subaru, and he is immensely important to her. He's the only person who can effortlessly break through her barriers, both literal and figurative, dispelling her loneliness even when she wants to wallow in it. His friendly, familiar attitude bothers her, but only because every kind gesture is a gust of wind through her aching heart that threatens to reignite the smoldering embers of hope that she worked so hard to extinguish. But they undeniably share a bond already, built both of inexplicable mysticism and mundane shared experience, and if Betty can accept him as that person, just as Subaru committed while facing down Echidna to make space in his heart for her, they may just be able to save each other from themselves. In much the same way Puck did for Amelia, and vice versa, so many years ago. And, of course, that connection's not the only one Subaru has. He's not alone, and he never has been, not really. Even if his parents couldn't help him through his anxiety and depression, they were always looking out for him. As soon as he set foot in Lagunica, Reinhard, friend to all in need, was just a cry for help away. And it didn't take him long at all to meet others. 
Rom, Petra, and the other villagers, Rome, Felt, Ferris, Krush, Wilhelm, Jules, Otto, and, of course, Emilia. There are plenty of people who think of him as a friend now, or at the very least would like to. It's doubtful that any of them, except maybe Emilia, will ever know everything he's gone through, but, I mean, that's just life, you know? We all fight our own hidden battles and struggle through pain nobody else understands, and the only way to overcome that is by trying our best in our own way. That's why Subaru's story has resonated so powerfully throughout the anime community and even outside it. That's why we're able to empathize so strongly not just with Subaru's solitude, but with that of Rem in her sister's shadow, Emilia in the frozen wastes, Krush in her haze of amnesia, Ferris having lost her closest friend, Wilhelm fighting to avenge his long-dead wife, Otto, who travels so much that Subaru seems to him like a decent friend to have, Felt, whose ambition set her apart from her fellow slum dwellers, and so many other wonderful characters in this anime. Loneliness is an inescapable part of the human condition, but that means none of us are alone in facing it. All of us are looking for help with what we're going through, and all of us want to help others through their own struggles. That's a small comfort when you're in the thick of it and facing something that only you can face, but it is a comfort nonetheless. There is always hope hidden in the horror that defines ReZero, even if it's not always easy to see, even if it can take everything just to reach blindly for it. You have to keep reaching. And if you're lucky enough to find another hand grasping through that darkness in the same direction as yours, hold on to it. Tight. ReZero was already one of my all-time favorite anime, and it just floors me how it's gotten progressively better throughout this new season. The depth of its characters, the intrigue of its world, the tightly woven nature of its time travel plot. With each new episode, each rewatch, I feel like I find something new to love about it. Which only makes me want more, but with the cores of season 2 being split and the next episode being the last until winter, I'm going to be wanting for a while. Luckily, this is a story with source material, and this season break is a great opportunity to catch up on the excellent light novels that inspired the anime. Even more luckilier, those light novels are presently being promoted by Bookwalker, who are offering up to 30% of your purchase back in Bookwalker coins when you buy either the light novels or the manga in ebook form before October 19th. They've also got pre-orders open for Volume 14, coming October 20th, which is slated to pick up right where this season ends, if you want to peek ahead. As a pre-order bonus, you'll also get a high-res picture of Echidna to stare at. On top of that, they also have four of the EX spin-off novels, for those of you who'd like to learn more about Krush, Ferris, Wilhelm, Reinhardt, and Julius, and spend a little more time getting lost in this world. Remember, whichever you want to read first, you can get 600 yen off your purchase by using the promo code BASEMENT when you check out. Links in the doobly-doo. On the other hand, if you'd like to fill the coming void by finding something new to watch, Yazzie and I just launched our new podcast, Basement Life, which you'll find over on its own channel, linked on screen or in the doobly-doo. Please check that out, it's very funny. Our first episode, we talk about uncomfortable Pokemon. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.